Good morning. For those of you who do not know me, Right, um, so once again, yeah, uh, and I'm at the Institute for Theoretical Physics, as you may know. I'm also a board member of the IMPRS, and so I had no escape when I was asked to participate in the Ring for Laser. Actually, I had been doing this some time ago on a different topic. Yeah, and <clears throat> the topic here is mathematical cosmology. Uh, the um, mathematical here features only to signalize that it is suitable for mathematicians. Um, and also the focus is a little bit on mathematical issues within cosmology. Yeah, um, concerning literature. Um, if you take a little bit of interest in science, then it might not have escaped your attention that there is a lot of progress in <coughs> astronomy has been over the last, let's say, two decades. There's um, <coughs> every once in a while something in the media about discoveries and so on. But there is in fact an enormous progress going on, which is also due to the fact that um, ever more, ever more precise instruments are being invented and introduced. <clears throat> and that leads to um, a very short lifespan of textbooks on cosmology. So as a rule of thumb, as concerns the presentation of observational facts, textbooks which are more than 10 years old are outdated, right? Well, this does not necessarily always affect all the theoretical presentation in those textbooks, but <coughs> the experimental findings are being accumulated at a very fast rate. Yeah? And that sometimes changes some paradigms or at least <coughs> varies them. So, um, and I have given uh, for the time being on, on the web page. So you, you may have noticed there's a web page for this. Uh, lecture. Where I can find some information where I um, <coughs> post uh, some details on dates if necessary. Um, <coughs> and I've also given some literature. So I've um, presented only uh, three books because they are more mathematical in their scope than others. Yeah. So, uh, for instance, there is uh, the first uh, book I have listed, that's this um, fairly big uh, book by Ellis and Company. And if you compare this with um, textbooks of a similar format, then you will notice that I emphasize some, let's say, issues on geometry or symmetries that are not so much present in <coughs> other textbooks. And this is because these, the, the authors are interested in these things and that is something that would be counted towards mathematical cosmology, if you like. I will <coughs> say a little bit more about that. Um, there is also uh, the book by um, Madame Choquet-Briand, and for some of you that uh, is probably a familiar name because she is a well-known mathematician and she has also written <coughs> a textbook on general relativity, a very recent textbook on general rel relativity. 
um, including some aspects of cosmology. And as the profile of the author suggests, this is far more mathematical than phenomenological, right? So <clears throat> and there's another textbook, recent one by Grön and Herwig, which I have listed. Actually, I've put it on the list yesterday. And uh, that also treats some, I mean, this is also mathematical in tone because the, the authors, it's a, it's a textbook on general relativity with some em emphasis on cosmology and the, mathem the authors are also mathematicians. <clears throat> so this is also um, uh, geared more towards um, mathematical topics in the field. <clears throat> right, uh, another book which I will still put on the list um, is Weinberg's book on cosmology. Now, this is by a theoretical physicist, um, and this is not very mathematical. Um, the great, uh, so it, it has something in it which is not so present in the other books, namely in the introduction. There's a very broad uh, discussion on recent observations and experiments and things like distance determinations, relative velocity de determinations uh, between galaxies and things like that. And this is a very good compilation and it's relatively recent, so it's not yet completely outdated. Okay, so, yeah, okay, so, um, and this is actually what I, at the moment, have to say about literature. So if I think there's something particularly interesting, which might be worth for you to have a look at, I uh, will also post this on the web page. Uh, and maybe I compile uh, links for to a few videos. YouTube offers you the complete possible visualizations of cosmology. Some are correct, some are not so correct. So I might pick some for you to look at. Yeah? As an inspiration or entertainment or what you like. <clears throat> okay, yeah, then. Um, well, I, I don't know if this here is already the first lecture of the series, maybe. Um, but uh, I will now uh, proceed by giving a little uh, introduction to things and a sort of historical overview. Now, this is not very mathematical, right? It's mainly an accumulation of facts and, and things. And mathematics starts a little bit later. So I hope this is nevertheless of interest for you. It is um, maybe um, worth keeping in mind that cosmology is a very uh, developing subject in physics. Um, so that means that in the course of history, the paradigms on cosmology get overthrown, exchanged, and so on. And maybe <clears throat> that is uh, something worth keeping in mind uh, for mathematicians. So if you are mathematicians, you try to um, chase the uh, internal truth of structures, logical structures. And now how, how does this connect to the world? Well, uh, that's not so clear. So people make hypotheses and assumptions and they make hypotheses and assumptions about the universe. Yeah? Cosmology is about the universe. Um, <clears throat> and of course one tries to, to make things as simple as possible to keep the uh, calculational effort low. And then after a while, uh, people get used to that. They, they, they get uh, exposed to the assumptions and hypotheses in lectures and so on. And they are 
may be presented as being very natural and then people absorb that and uh, don't keep in mind, well, this is basically a, a hypothesis and it could be different. Yeah? So, and in cos cosmology, it happens that every few decades, the um, range of the instruments extends far beyond what was possible before. And so one makes new um, uh, discoveries that don't fit into the previous mindset of hypotheses, which previously had been assumed natural. So <clears throat> it is important not to get too much trapped into thinking a hypothesis is for whatever reason natural. Uh, maybe based on existent knowledge, but if the knowledge grows, may appear in a completely different light. And cosmology is a good example of this. Okay, <clears throat> so let me start with uh, saying something <clears throat> about cosmology in general. So you may wonder, so what is cosmology? What is it about? It is about the investigation of the large scale structure of the universe and now it's, it's a bit difficult to say what is meant by universe, but uh, that is basically the field of astronomy. Um, you direct your observational instruments and, and methods, whatever that may be, outside of the Earth. And um, whatever you can see or detect from there is part of the universe. So there's no a priori limit. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> and then in broad terms, what you try to do is you try to reconstruct the history of the universe, um, how all this came about. And then when you are able to do that, you may be able to predict what will be going on in the future. To predict its future. Develop. So this is extremely broad and as I already said, all this is based on astronomical observation. So an astronomical observation um, then supplies you with some facts that you have to observe in order to, let's say, address these points here. <clears throat> so uh, let's um, compile the most important observational facts. that are presently known and confirmed and generally accepted. Um, I should again emphasize this here means the large scale structure of the universe. So we are talking about the largest scales which are known to us from observation. So it's not so much, uh, it's, it's certainly not the distance from here to the outer planets. It's certainly not the distance, be, distance scale between our galaxy and the neighboring galaxies, which is already quite some distance. Um, it is really about uh, the, the distance scale 
of our universe, or our galaxy, to the most remote galaxies that we can detect. Right? <coughs> so, <coughs> yeah, some observational facts. <coughs> so, there is the cosmological redshift <clears throat> so the basic phenomenon is that if this here is maybe our universe uh, sorry not universe galaxy seen from above then uh, there are many others uh, some are neighboring and uh, some are further away, some are spiral galaxies, and some have a different shape. Yeah. And uh, so this is a couple of million light years distance always in between, at least. And one observes um, the uh, light from these galaxies and one finds that there is a redshift. So you observe spectral lines um, <coughs> uh, from uh, the light emission here. There are suns in there. And you can look at the spectra. Typically, there's a hydrogen spectrum because hydrogen is typically is the most dominant, most abundant element in the stars. <coughs> and the, the stellar atmosphere gets heated, and so you have a lot of light caused by hydrogen transitions in the stellar atmospheres. And then <coughs> you can see that there are these spectra, these hydrogen spectra, <coughs> um, and that's also a hydrogen, we have also hydrogen spectra of our sun. And you observe that the <coughs> is uh, a, a wider spacing of the spectral lines. And this spacing, uh, this spread, uh, increases with the distance of the galaxies. So <clears throat> the interpretation is that these galaxies um, are recessing from us. All of them are moving away huh? and they're also moving away from each other so that is uh, the redshift and the redshift is the larger the more remote these galaxies are yeah? so <coughs> we have that the recession velocity of galaxies increases with their distance. So Z, this is the symbol for redshift. <coughs> um, is redshift is increasing function of v, the recession velocity. So here we have some recession velocity and here we have some uh, larger recession velocity because that object is much farther away. <coughs> so uh, there's, uh, if, if you look um, in textbooks or at articles, they talk about something at high Z. High Z means high redshift, and that means objects which are very far away. Huh? Really far away. So then there is the cosmic 
microwave background. Um, which is called, or abbreviated, CMB, Cosmic Microwave Background. So, um, there is a microwave radiation coming from everywhere, from all directions, homogeneously and isotropically. Um, and uh, at has been very carefully investigated that this is not coming from any nearby source or it's not uh, an average um, effect of several sources, stars and so on. It is a background radiation. Um, so this is a microwave radiation. having a black body, perfect black body spectrum at, well, black body temperature, which determines the spectrum around uh, 2.7 Kelvin. So if you have a, a so-called black body, which is kept at that temperature, then it radiates this radiation. Yeah, and it's microwave, so it's fairly long wavelength because the temperature is very low, uh, close to the absolute zero. Um, and this is received from all directions with high degree of homogeneity and isotropy. So it's like a, a thermal background path of radiation for the universe. Um, and then further point is that the matter distribution at least the luminous from which we can receive radiation um, of so galaxies, stars, um, oh, let's say, oh, well, stars at large, so galaxies, galaxy clusters, galaxy clusters, uh, gas clouds, One has detected large assemblies of gas clouds between galaxies. Um, <clears throat> well, and so on. Um, that appears approximately, at least, homogeneous and isotropic at the very large cosmic scales. So larger than scales larger uh, one billion light years. So to, to uh, make you understand what, what that means. So uh, uh, if you look at this fabric here, yeah, from very close, maybe you use a magnifying glass, 
then you see, well, it's a web. There are some laces and voids in between. This is not very isotropic and homogeneous at this short scale. Yeah? When, when you look at this with a magnifying glass, yeah? then you see structures. Hmm? Okay, understood? Good. So now you look at the same thing from the distance where you sit. Huh? So that's about a distance factor 100, 1000 larger. Okay? So, and there it appears like homogeneous and isotropic with the resolution that you have at your disposal. Okay? Because you average over a larger scale. Huh? You don't, uh, you have no resolution of these finer uh, substructures. Huh? And this is what is meant here. Huh? Same idea, same picture. Huh? If you look uh, at a piece of cloth from um, further away, then you average over the substructures and it appears homogeneous and isotropic at that scale. Huh? If you look closer, if you look at the scale of galaxies, let's say, uh, it's not homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, you see some structure. There is something, there's nothing, there is something, and it's not even uh, something like regularly distributed. Huh? But if you average over a larger scale, it appears um, homogeneous and isotropic. Well, actually, this, this uh, conclusion here is uh, sort of permanently subject to challenge. Huh? This is not necessarily taken for granted. It is not as well established as the two points before. Yeah? And in fact, recent investigations uh, point um, at uh, putting this into question. Huh? But for the time being, uh, it's still, I think, um, the main paradigm in cosmology. Yeah, so, and then um, one observes that hydrogen and helium the light elements are by far the most abundant elements in the universe. And, well, since we can um, see objects that are very, very far away, something like uh, more than 10 uh, billion light years, and the light needs so long to travel to us, well, I have to regard this with some caution, um, uh, that is, so to say, the naive way of, of putting it. But <clears throat> basically that means the universe must have been there in some form, at least at that time back. Yeah? So the age of the universe is well, by order of magnitude, at least around 10 billion years old. Yeah, and <clears throat> another point is, so you look at galaxies far away, um, 
and um, you, you, you essentially see, you know, all, all you see basically uh, is the radiation that is coming. Yeah? So radiation in the optical range, in the radio range, and uh, also in the X-ray range and gamma range. And <clears throat> you can make spectroscopy with that. Uh, particularly well. You can do this in the optical and let's say radar longer wave range. <clears throat> and you see, uh, so the observation is that you get the same spectral lines apart from their increased spacing, but otherwise it's, it's the same as for the spectral lines, let's say coming from our sun or what we observe in the lab here on Earth. So, um, uh, that is interpreted as saying, well, the local physical processes in gravitationally bound systems, like a galaxy, or a planetary system, um, they are the, the same as here on Earth. Yeah? The relative strengths of the fundamental interactions are the same in a remote galaxy as here. Yeah? All the couplings, especially the relative couplings, but also to some degree the absolute couplings are the same because we use, I mean this is an underlying hypothesis, otherwise it would be difficult um, <coughs> to conclude uh, from redshift to recession velocity. Huh? Now, um, but basically that, that is the assumptions. assumption. The physical processes in a distant galaxy are the same as the ones we have here. Yeah? Same physics everywhere, you could say. Yeah? There are not different physical laws at stake somewhere else, huh? which is completely different from what we know here. Huh? At least, so far, there is no really a good indication that one would be forced to assume otherwise. And therefore this is, well, there is some evidence from, from the analysis of spectral lines and this seems to be a good hypothesis. Um, so, physics um, at any place in the universe is the same as on Earth, on the solar system. So there's no indication To the contrary, well, this could always pop up out of a sudden, but for the moment there is no indication. <coughs> uh, there is, however, indication for something which uh, is not so known to us here on Earth, but then the contention is that this actually manifests itself on larger scales, there are indications for dark matter and dark energy, and these buzzwords have a um, have a particular meaning in a in a certain context, and we will come to, to that. Um, finally, <clears throat> um, the finiteness, actually finiteness in time, one should say, of the universe
is the favorite scenario and there are some indications for that although they are maybe not directly based on observations uh, that require some theoretical interpretation um, <clears throat> and what is by fine what is meant by finiteness here is that the universe exists so far for a finite amount of time. In a sense, there has been a beginning of time in a certain sense. A more precise sense is, uh, can be discussed in the framework of general relativity. Right, so this is more or less the basic facts that one has to comply with when one uh, starts and attempts to build a cosmological theory. So a cosmological theory is to be consistent <coughs> with these facts and <coughs> it should answer the following questions. Right, so, um, yeah, okay, one observes that the universe is changing, yeah? It is not, not static, we have these recession velocities, for instance, um, they are an indication that things are changing. We also see other things that are changing. For, for instance, we see collisions of, of galaxies. Yeah. So there are very big structures with move, which move with respect to each other. And uh, that is somehow like a dynamical system. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this dynamical system at the very large scales, then things become simpler because at very large scales, um, it looks almost homogeneous and isotropic. It's a bit like a fluid yeah, or gas, a gas. Yeah. So, um, then you could yeah, then you are inclined to, to look at the universe and, and the stuff it is made of, very large scales, at a, as a dynamical system. And you can wonder uh, what then is the corresponding dynamics? What is the large scale dynamics? of the universe. Um, and now those of you who have a little bit experience with dynamical systems, uh, one question is, of course, uh, well, we, ask, we, we observe essentially a state which is sort of, well, advanced in the development. So you can uh, try and predict or retradict 
the dynamic, the, the states from the, the state as we see it presently. And <coughs> then you can, can try to uh, follow the dynamics backwards in time and you uh, could wonder, um, is there an initial state? And also you can try to extrapolate the dynamics to the future and you can ask the question, is there a final, finite, final state? Or maybe it's transits to a chaotic uh, behavior and that is then related to stability of the dynamical system. So <clears throat> are there initial respectively final states for this dynamics? Um, <clears throat> and if you think about this a little bit. Um, you can sort of uh, uh, state this question in a slightly different form. You can say, you can ask, um, can the present state of the universe as we observe it today We explained as the result of dynamical evolution from an initial state and maybe a distinguished initial state. That has uh, in fact uh, been uh, some discussion between Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, uh, Jim Hartle and some philosophers of science and uh, well I have to be a bit careful because this uh, questions of this sort uh, have the tendency to, to somehow uh, depart from their uh, initial motivations and to uh, develop a dynamics in their own right, uh, often forgetting that one has made considerable simplifications and idealizations um, to come up to this stage and this is not the full story. <coughs> yeah, but nevertheless you can um, see that at a somewhat more fundamental level, you can ask the question, is the present state um, of the universe the result of a dynamics that derives from the known interactions. Or is new physics needed to understand
cosmological evolution. Um, yeah, that uh, is an interesting question. Um, the current understanding is that dark matter uh, is really needed in models of cosmological evolution uh, according to our current understanding because without a significant dark matter component uh, numerical simulations show that um, the early galaxies could not have formed at this time scale we think they have been formed within. So, um, in a sense, uh, this is uh, an, an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think at, at the present time it cannot be answered uh, conclusively, uh, if it could ever be answered conclusively, but um, certainly at the moment this is open. Right, and then I have here um, uh, a sketch of the historical development. Actually, this is a bit more extended than I wanted it to be. I have to see how much I can present of this. <coughs> Okay, so let's try. <clears throat> so there is a sketch of historical development. Um, and I emphasize that this is a very arbitrary selection. in the sense that historians of science might object. Um, so I start here with, with uh, Ptolemaeus and that's so around uh, the year 100 um, <clears throat> and this is um, Uh, well, what he does, uh, he has a, sorry, not geometric, geocentric view of the world. So the Earth is in the middle and the um, uh, well, the, the uh, planets and stars are somewhere in spheres. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he has developed, well, at least a sort of mathematical theory for the planetary motion, the theory of epicycles. So this uh, can be counted as one of the first attempts to um, have a, a quantitative mathematical theory of planetary motion. Um, <clears throat> then there is Nicolaus Copernicus. Oh, sorry. Copernicus. That's uh, in the <clears throat> 15th century <clears throat> and there's a paradigm change now he proposes a heliocentric um, view of the world. Essentially saying um, <clears throat> the sun sits in the center, the planets 
uh, revolve around it, and well, the stars are somewhere else. <coughs> um, and he describes uh, the motion of the uh, planets as circular orbits. around the sun, which is not very well in agreement with observations. Um, <clears throat> but um, this is a, a, an instance where uh, maybe uh, aesthetic and religious uh, biases uh, make people think that it cannot be otherwise because this is the most perfect motion according to Copernicus. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> then we also have Galilei um, uh, in the 16th century and yeah he is the father of modern physics. He comes up with the law of free fall. Um, the foundations of physics in uh, proposing that one should systematically compare theory, mathematically formulated in a quantitative manner with experiments and he does so for the free fall. Um, and he uses the telescope invented just before um, in astronomy. Actually, he's the first one of whom we know that he does so. Um, and he discovers. Uh, the moons of Jupiter, planet Jupiter, and the Saturn rings. Yeah, this is quite an advance. Um, and then a little later, uh, comes Kepler, that's also in the 16th century, um, and he discovers the laws of planetary motion um, which are still valid today. Basically, so the uh, planets move on ellipses with the uh, sun in one of the foci. And um, <clears throat> he also is one to, uh, well, make a supernova observation because there was one nearby enough at these times and he um, <clears throat> sort of interprets that as an exploding star. <clears throat> so, which is sort of right. Um, Okay, then there was Newton in the 17th century and 
Yeah, okay, so he has influenced physics quite a bit for the next centuries to come. Um, <coughs> he came up with the laws of mechanics. Um, in great generality, um, the law of gravity, Newton's law of gravity, which are uh, uh, still is a very, very good approximation. Um, and you can fly to the moon with it and also to planets um, because relativistic corrections um, <clears throat> at a moderate time scale are very, very tiny. <clears throat> he also came up with a theory of light. Um, <clears throat> uh, which um, gave a first account of uh, the electromagnetic or optical spectrum of light, uh, which is very important for astronomy. Um, and he also was very active in optics and he invented the first mirror telescope. Um, and he also um, invented a theoretical concept of space-time. And also had a theory of creation of stars, which is interesting in so far as he views stars as something um, which is not there eternally, but can be created. This is sort of the complementary view here of Kepler's, who interprets a, a supernova explosion as a star, so something like the sun, which um, <clears throat> can cease to exist. Yeah? So already here is, is the first idea um, that stars are not there eternally, that they are something similar to the sun, but they have an, a, a dynamics, yeah? a finite lifetime. <clears throat> yeah, and then there is a William Herschel um, in the 18th century and he was someone who uh, managed to get funding for the construction of large mirror telescopes for the time. And with that, uh, he was able to discover the planet Uranus <coughs> and the moons of Saturn. And um, he also discovered the infrared radiation of the sun for our sun and yeah and in particular um, uh, with these telescopes it was possible to see nebulae so distant objects which were not appearing point-like, like stars. Um, and later these were then found to be galaxies. And yeah, so he saw these tabulae and he started classifying them. So 
So they uh, appeared in these, viewed in these telescopes as uh, something fuzzy, not point-like. And so they were uh, called nebulae at that time. So then I have here Albers. And Albers is uh, also in the 18th century. And he is an example how uh, application of mathematics can uh, lead you to interesting insights. Um, so he is known for the so-called Olbers paradoxon. Well, it was considered a paradoxon maybe at that time. It was presented as a paradoxon still later. So <clears throat> And that says, if the universe is infinite, and the distribution of stars is homogeneous, homogeneous, then you are forced to conclude that the visible sky must be brighter than the surface of the sun. Well, <clears throat> uh, that seems, well, actually this is very simple. So if you are mathematically minded, you uh, somehow see it uh, immediately. So let this here be our solar system. And then here you take a radius R. And then you look at what radiation you get in a volume. Yeah. So you get a radiation from the sphere or from, from the volume of stars here in this sphere of a certain thickness. And you see that the uh, power of radiation that you get is proportional to number in this slice here of some thickness um, <coughs> epsilon um, so n epsilon, n epsilon r times well there is this inverse square law well so radiation decays uh, like that. And now you see if you have a homogeneous distribution, then with increasing radius, um, the leading order here that you get is R cubed. Yeah. So the number of stars with a homogeneous distribution grows with the volume. The volume grows with a uh, radius cubed the radiation drops 1 over r squared. So what you get is something which grows if the universe is fi infinitely extended. Yeah? So, um, and one can do certain refinements. One can say, okay, what about if the sources here are not point-like and not only emit radiation, but also absorb radiation and so on. But in leading order, uh, when 
you plug in such corrections, it gives the same result. Even as you see, you can have the number of density of stars dropping somewhat with radius, need not be constant. So as long as you get something in the end here uh, for this product, which uh, <coughs> grows beyond limits as R grows, goes to infinity, um, you are left with the same conclusion. So this already is, is an indication or has been an indication that the universe cannot be of this form. Hmm? So the stars cannot be there forever. Probably the universe cannot extend in space without limit. Yeah. Um, or one must assume that there is some uh, stuff uh, floating around which is absorbing radiation and not emitting any, but this would then be different physics to the one we, we are used to. I mean, this has also been uh, discussed um, if there is some stuff uh, which is uh, uh, absorbing things, but then you have a, a thermodynamic equilibrium uh, with radiation, so that is all not helping very much without is having to assume different physics. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, but this was this was considered really a paradoxon because that does not appear to be a reason that the universe should not be, uh, well, infinite. Why should it be finite? Well, this infinity is, of course, an idealization, and it it's, um, comes about by uh, this apparent uh, homogeneity and isotropy. Yeah? That does not appear to be a preferred place or preferred direction. So that uh, uh, more or less, if you, if you think of, of uh, three-dimensional Euclidean geometry, uh, leases, leaves very little place for us, uh, but assuming that things in, extend infinitely. Yeah? So, <coughs> Um, this was uh, not taken so seriously, but people had uh, had it on their minds. Yeah, I actually have some pages to go on with this, but I think I have to postpone this uh, to our next meeting, right? Because I'm already over time. Okay, so there will then be more of this next time. I hope it's not too boring for you because it's not mathematics yet. <laughs> okay, thank you.